Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you haven't had a chance, head on over to Instagram and YouTube and see all the great reviews and game reviews and book reviews and all the great little things that we've been doing on over there. You can feel free to hit subscribe or follow and you'll get all the updates there on those chosen platforms. If you also haven't, please, 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 please leave us a review. It'd be really, really nice. And if you haven't, hit subscribe on the podcast so you can get the daily feed and have us blasting it into your ears on a <laughs> twice a day, twice a week uh, basis. Friday's always a little bit shorter. Mondays are always the, the fun episodes. Fridays, Thursdays, booza. The short bites come out on Thursdays and have for <clears throat> a year. Listen, <laughs> I'm definitely not the CEO of this operation. <laughs> I'm not even the COO. I'm not even the CTO. Actually, I am the CTO. I think CT- you're CFO. I'm the CTO. And CFO. I'm not the CFO. You're the CFO. I don't think that's a good idea. You have a lot of C and O's in your titles, (laughs) and I I just have the T. Anyway, that being said, we're going to start off today with with a quote from one of the greatest chefs of all time. And he said once, Remy, anyone can cook. (laughs) And that, and that, that quote was from the immortal Chef Gusteau. Yes, Chef Gusteau. From Ratatouille. That's right. <laughs> Today, co- as we're getting into the holidays, we wanted to talk about kitchen classroom. This, this is one of those areas, you know, if you um, have done Blossom and Root or Torchlight or, or uh, Build Your Library, there's always mentions of doing kitchen classrooms. And I think a lot of curriculums talk about those and they give you a recipe to do. Um, and, you know, even if you're not following a curriculum, but just, you know, you, you want to get your kids in the kitchen, you know, it's a good learning experience. But how do we go about that and make it a really good experience for our kids is kind of the thought I had, you know, with, with putting this together. You know, one of the things that we always talk about it, you know, we always fearful of when they're in the kitchen is, you know, getting injured. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, obviously we, we don't let our our six year old near the salamander blast furnace, you know, that we don't don't have salamander. If we did, we'd be making amazing Mexican food all the time. Oh, and, and great pizza too. That's right. But you know, there's always that fear and, you know, how do I approach it? How how do I find those moments to bring my kid into the into the you know the the kitchen? And we already we already know as homeschoolers we we love to see our kids experience things. We learn always, life skills as well. The life skills and all those type of things. We don't want our kids going off to college only making ramen noodles and mac and cheese. Right, that was me. That was totally me. Well, I mean that, that that's going to be our daughter because she loves ramen noodles, <laughs> mac and cheese. <laughs> but hopefully she'll not do a few other things. A few other things. So I mean, so how do we do that? So like you know. First thing you got to understand is, you know, why do we cook with our kids? You know, food is such an important thing. I mean, a species food is life. Yeah, species wise. I mean, food is is that thing that we always sit around the table. You know, we've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years, sitting together eating, and that is, it's like in our DNA. It's like in our evolution to bond and talk. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the, you know, there's been a lot of silver linings in the pandemic, but then you know, a few have been that we've been able to share most of our meals together. You know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it is that great little time where we can kind of come together. So let's talk about food, why it's important, you know, to bring our kids into the classroom, in, into the kitchen classroom. So, you know, you were talking about, you know, not sending our kids off, only knowing how to make ramen noodles. So that's mm-hmm. the first thing, self-sufficiency, um, both for their future adult lives and for now. I love the fact that our kid can go in and make herself lunch and breakfast, uh, you know, not using the stove, obviously, but, you know, she's able to make uh milk and uh you know cereal and yeah. you know make sandwiches and get things out for lunch and well, i like indep- that it's also the independence like you know right. having them get their own water having them to get their own right. snack having them to you know dare i say make their own breakfast our, our six-year-old you know came running downstairs the other day and demanded to make breakfast so i let her do it well right and there you know she's even able to now use some of the equipment with us present uh, to make, you know, put things in the microwave and stuff. So I think it's really great. So self-sufficiency, uh, certainly. 
The second thing is when your kids have a, a role in preparing foods, they're willing to try different foods, mm -hmm. which is really great for those picky eaters. Uh, side note, if you have a picky eater, subscribe to Universal Yums. <laughs> this is not a Universal Yums commercial, but we've been subscribers for about a year and getting boxes of snacks from around the world. Our kids have tried some off the wall stuff they would never eat normally because it was in the Universal Yum snack box. Mm -hmm. And now we notice that at dinner and, you know, when we're at grandma's house or we're, you know, anywhere else and They're there's something different. At least taste it. They'll at least taste food. So if you have really picky eaters, we recommend that as a way to like break that ice. Uh, so, yeah. So getting kids in the kitchen helps them, you know, when they've had a role in creating it, they want to eat better. They want to try more things. You know, and then bonding, that, that kind of that aspect that we talked about. That's right. You know, this is, a, you know, cooking together is bonding. That's why we cook together as families at holidays and things. It's, it's a bonding experience. It also gives our kids a role in family traditions as we're coming into the holidays. Yeah. You know, it it gives our kids a a, a place in the the you know the hierarchy within the family. I, I mean, know, you just made pumpkin cookies tonight, right? <laughs> with our girls, and it's it's the thing that's like, oh, every year, you know, it, it for example, every year Nana and Mom make thanksgiving dinner well this year our daughter's gonna be old enough to help us make the mashed potatoes and do things yeah, like exactly. that and, and so that gives her a place in in the family in the tradition um the other thing from the homeschooling per perspective purely is yeah. that we can incorporate a ton of academics into cooking activities and we'll go through those in a bit and, mm -hmm. you know what we can do well, but that's you, why yeah and if you've been following us on youtube we've been doing um every two to one to two weeks we've been doing a kind of a, a vlog about our around the world journey with the torchlight um, we're so village. cool we have a vlog we do yes all, all, seven, sure all 70 or 80 people there. who watch it <laughs> um the we, you know we've been doing reviews and and in, in those reviews we always talk about what we do during the week as we go through or you know go around the world following the two curriculums that we've blended together and we always talk about food and how important yeah, that we is. Love so food. you know food for us is you know Every, every week, not only are we picking the books that we're going to be doing, but we're also picking the recipes that we're going to be doing. So, you know, we really incorporate the kitchen and the, you know, the idea of food into our homeschool from a top level thing. Like it's an important thing for us to try different recipes every week. So mm -hmm. absolutely. So, you know, the academics, I think, is the first thing that we always think about. So how can, you know, academics fit into the kitchen classroom. That's probably the first thing people think about. So starting at the youngest age with our toddler preschoolers, we have a two-year-old and, and... I do it. I do it. Yeah. They certainly <laughs> want to be very helpful. So this I is hope, a great... I hope. <laughs> So for for the toddler preschool set, this this teaches dexterity, it's textures, yeah. colors, how to follow directions, <laughs> patience if you can get it. <laughs> um, so lots Very of rare. good school, skills for our toddler preschool set. You know, they're going to learn mixing and scooping and just all kinds of dexterity things. Well, and, and I think also just like the trust that you let them be part of it i think is a big oh, yeah. thing yeah they're starting to feel like they can start to do things or start to be well, a little bit and, independent. And, they want to be, and they just want to be part of things so it's like it is hard it is hard because you know i think we turned around and all of a sudden the two-year-old today had the the mixing bowl with the with this with the uh the whisk and like flour was flying out yeah, yeah. she was super excited about that I turned my back for a second don't <laughs> do that second. one second <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's great. Yeah. It's great for toddlers and preschoolers to get in there and get an opportunity to help and do something constructive with us. Uh, we'll talk about how to make that a positive experience a little bit later Definitely because it can fun. go pear-shaped very quickly with young children. So we'll talk about that. Um, as we get older, then yeah. reading is the next big thing, right? We're reading recipes. We're reading the box directions. My, you know, my daughter is helping me make mac and cheese. It can be something really easy. It doesn't have to be a, a huge involved meal for her to get some reading practice. But also understanding what's in what's in the food, right? Right. What's on the label? You know, it, it, her. Uh, she's a friend who's allergic to peanuts. Yes. And so um, she was over the other day, and and I said, oh well, you know, we're gonna have this, and she said, well, are there are there any nuts in it? And I gave the box to our daughter and said, can you please look at the ingredients and see if there's any nuts? I, of course double checked because I don't want anyone going into anaphylactic shock in my house but it was a good experience for our yeah. daughter to be re reading the ingredient label and trying to understand what's in food and so um, yeah I thought that that was really valuable so reading 
all the way across, you know. But, but then also, obviously, when we're doing recipes, we're measuring things, we're counting tons things. Of tons of math. Tons of math involved. I mean, really almost, practical almost, math. Yeah, practical math, but also almost as much math as like you would get in like a simple board game. Like oh, I have to count or Absolutely. I have to do fractions. Counting, and like that. there's yeah. measuring. You're, you're right, totally talking about fractions. There's weighing of yes. food and then you have doubling or halving of recipes depending mm -hmm. on what we're doing um y you know it's also like the other day we made something with chocolate chips and i didn't have quite enough chocolate chips mm -hmm. in one bag so she had to like look at one bag and go okay well this is this many ounces and then i had to take some from another bag to get yeah. this many right so yeah. there's some addition i mean there's there's so much practical math in cooking that if you have a reluctant math kid, cooking is a great way to include some some terrific math skills. I mean, cook, cooking has two, two sides of it, too. You have the kitchen side, but also, you also have the store side. So when you do take them right. to the store, you're purchasing things, you have money. And, you know, if you if you really, you know, c go whole hog into this, you can say, okay, I want my budget to be $10 for the meal tonight or whatever it might be. Sure. You can absolutely bring in a lot of math when you're shopping for the very meal that you're going to be making in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, doing price comparisons. I, you know, that's an interesting point you bring up shopping. I had forgotten on the back onto the reading uh, aspect. I We were studying letters with our daughter. Uh, I don't know, this was a year ago or so. We went to the store and we wanted to make a, a meal com completely comprised of things that started with the letter A. Yeah. So we had to get a vegetable and we had to get a bread product and some meat and some grains. And we had everything had to start with A. And so that's another fun way that you can kind of incorporate that. I forgot all about doing that, but that's that was yeah. really fun. Our daughter loved going to the store and, and looking for things that started with A. Absolutely. And then going from math, you get right into the science. So, you know, how do foods change? You know, what are, if you're in... Baking is great yeah, if for you're, that. Yeah, if you're a high altitude, you have to, you know, increase or decrease the temperature. You have humidity concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when you're baking, I think that's a really cool in the news is you can even bring in a little bit of science. Even if you have like a little bit of an older learner or two, if you're incorporating fat and salts into your, you know, your meal, you can understand why it's important to brown the meat on mm -hmm. the grill and, you know, what is the salt actually doing to the proteins on the outside? Yeah, I mean, those if you look are at really, the cookbook really cool like, yeah. um, like the food lab, if you have yeah. an older learner, it's an adult level book. So, um, you know, if you have a much older learner, that's a terrific one for science because yeah. he talks all about, you know, the reactions that happen and why we... You know, why we brine something first or why we marinate or why we don't cook too high a heat or, you know, I mean, each recipe has lots of information. America's Test Kitchen is also really good for that. What's the other one? The salt fat. Uh, salt fat acid, acid heat. heat. That's, another uh, that's a really great book. And it, it also talks about and then the, that has, that has the a, components um, that, that that adds to food. That has the show on Netflix as well. Yeah, yeah. which is actually a really good show. Yeah. We really enjoy so, it. So next thing is history, too. You know, if you're if you're cooking through you know, a region or you're trying to cook through time, you know, you can actually like try to study the historical aspects of food or right. even if you're like, you're learning about a certain region, maybe they were in, integral in the salt trade, you know, hundreds of years ago, whatever it might right. be, you know, you can bring in history, you can fold those types of things. And there's a lot of great, oh, I, I can't remember it, but I'll put it in the, in the YouTube, I'll, I'll put the YouTube link in the show notes. There's a really great guy who cooks them um, like 1800, 1700s, 1600s meals. I've shown it to you. Yeah. It's I think it's really Townsend. Cool YouTube. I think it's called Townsend. I'll put it in the show notes. He's really, really, really cool. cool. He cooks recipes from, you know, the 1700s in the way they would cook it back then. So you can definitely pull in a lot of history as well. A lot of history and really understand what someone's life was like at that time. Absolutely. It's really great. Yeah. How about art? Yeah. So, f I mean, food is art, especially, you know, if you're going to talk about baking or how you're going to arrange the plate, uh, the presentation of food. So if you have a very creative child, you know, food brings in a lot of art. Or if you have a child who feels like they're not very artistic, Right. This is a great creative outlet, you know, yeah. that they can they can use. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of art in food, um, especially and, with color. Like, if, oh, it, especially if you can cook with a little bit of color, you can really have it come through and just be very vibrant. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about like social studies and geography? You know, we talked about the history, but regions of the world also. Right. This is just what we do. Right. We're looking exactly. at different countries of the world and we're making foods that they're known for. And then we're talking about, oh, you know, um, uh, foods from Italy are made with o olives and that's because it's very dry there. And we're talking yeah. about the geology of the area and, you know, Oh, this, this climate produces this. And, you know, so there's lots and lots of discussions that are happening, uh, not only about other cultures, but about other, um, 
other geographies and or, or even ingredients, climates, like different types of ingredients that you can incorporate. Like I know you've done some, you know, your, your quest to make great, um, what is it, butter chicken? Yeah, like yeah, Indian. Butter yeah, chicken. yeah. It, chicken tikka, butter chicken. chicken. They're so they're yeah. so close. I but, it's but not Indian, but I love it anyway. You, you get to take your children to some of these ethnic stores where you can actually get really crazy, you know, awesome oh, ingredients. I that love are doing things that they never have tasted before. We know? have an amazing Indian store not too far from us here in mm-hmm. the Seattle area, and I took my daughter there when we were. Um, I think it was just before we started our around the world journey, yeah. but I was, I wanted to make a uh, chicken tikka yeah. masala and I went there to buy stuff and she was just like, she's like, there's so many smells and she's looking all over <laughs> yes. and just taking in all the different ingredients. Yeah. And uh, I ended up buying a bunch of things there that were frozen that were, that were some of them were pre-cooked or, or, you know, that was a yeah. part of a meal that we could make and did all this taste testing. They, there's a, um, flatbreads, parathas, and yeah. we got a bunch of different ones so we could just do taste testing and mm-hmm. they're learning all, not just about culture, but about flavor and mm-hmm. it's, you know, food is amazing. So the people are sold. They're yeah, gonna, cook with your kids, learn about nutrition and the digestive system and yeah, measuring and having it. and all this stuff. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. L- learn about anti antacids on certain foods that some people have to take. <laughs> Very important. So they're sold. They're going to kitchen school. They're 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 not. They've done game schooling. Now they're going to kitchen school. You know what are the things they have to think about when they when they start to incorporate food? You know what are the, you know, plans? How do they determine what they're going to do? You know what are those concerns that they have? Yeah, I think that you know if you're going to look, if you want to incorporate cooking every day with your kids, that's great, yeah. and you can do that without a plan in mind. But if you really want to, you know, get some academics really um, as a purposeful thing, then just think about your goals Mm -hmm. with using Kitchen Classroom. What are your homeschooling goals? Like, oh, I have a child that's struggling in math. I want to, you know, push this more. Or, you know, we don't have a science curriculum this year um, or a strong one. And I'm going to, you know, incorporate a bunch of, you know, I'm going to do human anatomy and the digestive system Mm -hmm. and and all about the taste buds. And just, you know, you can do all kinds of things, right? Or the science of bread or whatever it might be. Right. Or if you're going to have a kitchen garden outside you can bring that garden you know you can do horticulture Absolutely. as part of your cooking kitchen classroom so you know i mean it's Growing october herbs and it's october right now so our, our our friends down in the upside down world down below on the southern hemisphere are starting to do their gardens we are going to lock down for the winter well, yeah, but, but you can start to think gar- about if it. you're gonna yeah. plant garlic and things you can do it in the you're fall gonna do it right now or you get in your winter garden also your winter garden is, is yeah, going strong you can or... start to pull that into your cooking kitchen classroom mm-hmm. and then fold in a little bit of science and academics around that so if you want to do kitchen classroom as a real part of homeschool and, and make it a, a real purposeful thing i just think about your goals you know for us right now for example our goal is to experience other cultures because we're doing yeah. it with our around the world study and to give our kids some dexterity practice, you know, and, and a bit of reading for our six-year-old. Mm-hmm. That's kind of mostly my goals with it. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, just think about it. Think about what means makes the most sense for you and your kids and kind of what you want them to get out of it so you have a focus. Yeah, another thing that you like to do is you've been kind of on this this quest for the best X. Yes. Right? So I already have the perfect meatball. But, you already uh, have the perfect meatball. That's the, that's the only one that I, I would say I found the perfect I'm America's test kitcheting it myself. Yes. On certain things. But, but like you could even you, you don't even have to have a big plan. You could just say, hey, you know what? My 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 student loves pizza. Yeah. And so we're gonna spend fifty weeks of the year and we're gonna fifty two weeks and we're gonna make pizza every week or maybe pizza every other week and we're gonna try different types and we're gonna study about dough. And we're going to, sh- you know, think about how we're going yeah. to do this. I mean, you can really take it any way you want, you, you know, really make it child focused. You can incorporate it into the curriculum like we have. You can incorporate it within your science, with your backyard garden. So really just think about what, what your goals are, what you're hoping to achieve. And I think that can help direct because really cooking is so broad, right? I mean, you can totally. do anything with cooking. Um, to have it a little bit more narrow and a little bit more focused, I think can, it, it makes it easier to incorporate into your homeschool life. Yeah, I agree. So, you know... What if you don't know how to cook? Most people don't. <laughs> I mean, uh, my, my 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 ex boss, long time ago, man, never went to his his fridge was empty. Yeah, he ate out every meal. There's a lot of folks who either, um, if if you feel that you either can't cook or you can only cook a couple of things, and so you're a bit worried. You know, we we have a friend that uh, we always talk about this that she 
she always goes, oh man, I wish I could cook more with my daughter, but I just don't really know how to cook very much. And yeah. so she feels uncomfortable in the kitchen herself and, and is worried about how she's going to, you know, do this with her daughter, but she, she wants to, you know? And so you're talking about how you approach that. I think the first thing is start with really basic skills yeah. and just learn together with your child. So that view that as an opportunity, like, okay, if I can only, you know, make a couple of things, then let me get a cookbook and start with the most you know, basic of stuff. You can even get a kid's cookbook and we'll talk about, we've got some really great recommendations later. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, get that and say, okay, let's start with something easy, like how to make scrambled eggs, you know, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> how to cook a piece of chicken. I mean, just, yep. you know, you don't need to go with really elaborate recipes to start with. Don't feel that pressure. If you don't feel very comfortable cooking, say to your child, we're going to learn this together. Mm-hmm. And, definitely start with things that you're interested in. Like, for example, you know, how to cook an egg would be very basic. It's usually at the beginning of a lot of cookbooks. But if you hate eggs, please (laughs) find something that you and your kid both really like to eat and work together on it and grow your skills together. And that's such a that that's such a great bonding opportunity. For example, if you if you're into pasta and you like having pasta sauce every week, right? You're not going to go out and make your own pasta sauce. That's really hard. And it's hard to find the right recipe. But at your store, there is like an entire wall of pasta sauces. Don't just get the ragu. Maybe you step up and you get the nice Mazzano or the... Yeah, Mazetta. Mazetta, like yeah. That's the one we like. You know, try different pasta sauce. Try different types of pasta. Maybe try a different protein. And then mix it up, right? It's super simple, right? Right. Was that the Sandra Lee semi-homemade? Right? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe it doesn't just... have to be scratch everything. No, no. It certainly doesn't. Maybe you're going to... Um, you know, a pasta sauce is a great example, yes, right? So. Um, cause you can use, you can use tomatoes fresh and all that stuff yeah. and cut it up and whatever. Or you could start with some tomato paste and some can and a can of tomato sauce that's, mm-hmm. you know, plain sauce. And then you can add your own extra onions, carrots, you know, things like that. Right. So you, you definitely don't need to start completely from scratch. I think that's a great point. Um, I think start with things that you like mm-hmm. that, aren't too too difficult and really get those basics down and then you can use those as the building blocks to get to more complicated recipes and talking about recipes i think it's very important it doesn't even have to be a full meal it could be a side dish like a, right. like a, a salad like learn I'm how just... to make some salad dressings oh my gosh yes. like uh, there's a million different types of salad dressing find ones that you and your kids love um don't be intimidated by cooking if you aren't really a, a good cook or don't feel comfortable really mm-hmm. Just just start with some easier uh, things and build your skills with your learner. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're looking at recipes, it's it's really tough when you first start out. <laughs> when I first started out, it's a million recipes. Uh, uh, you know, cooking. I I would look at a recipe and I would make it and it wouldn't turn out. And then I'd go, well, I don't know. Was it me? Or was it the recipe? And if you yeah. got it from a blog, which is, a, I mean, not a bad place to get recipes. I've gotten plenty of great recipes from blogs, but. When you're not a confident cook, I think it's really best to use recipes that you know are really good. One of the best things I can I can give as a piece of advice if you don't feel comfortable cooking is to use an America's Test Kitchen cookbook. Absolutely. Because it's, you... It's not the recipe, it's you. Right. If your recipe doesn't turn out, it's absolutely you. Because they've tried that recipe so many times that you obviously didn't, you know, you didn't follow direction yeah, we'll, somewhere. We'll put a link or, to, the, um, to the book and the show in the show notes. Yeah, we, we love that. We think it's just a great way to start. Um, don't, you know, don't get recipes off blogs. Be really careful about things where uh, there's a lot of ratings, but a lot of people have changed it. Here's my example. All recipes, like, okay, there's everything on all recipes. It's a great place to go if you want to find something. However, people will say, oh, this is a five-star recipe. And then in their review, they're like, and I substituted this and I changed the quantity of that. And this was too salty. So I did this other thing. And basically everybody has doctored that recipe. <laughs> if if you took the reviews of how many people actually made the recipe as written, it would be so much smaller. So be really, really careful if you're, you know, familiar with cooking and everything and go there because you can clearly see there's a recipe and there's absolutely no salt in it. You're like, ah, I think we're going to have to add some salt there. Um, you know, but if you're a new cook, just be really cautious about crowdsourced recipes because they could be all over the place. You really want to go somewhere you can trust. That's my best advice. And then the recipes, when they do find a recipe, start simple, as few ingredients as possible. Yeah. Because you get more of a pure output of that thing like 
Right. Like a, a good pasta sauce should have probably four ingredients. Well, right. I mean, my pasta sauce has many well, more than well, that, my, but... My grandma's pasta sauce has less than that. Well, yeah. And hers is the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you love her. It is the best. Grandma I sauce. I Well, it's very, it's a unique, very sweet. Uh, anyways. Uh, it's we, directly from Sicily. We digress. We digress. Um, yeah, try try not to get things that are overly complicated when you start. Just try to keep it down to, you know, fewer ingredients. It makes it easier, too, for you to tell when something goes wrong. I like a lot of times to start, too, with baking. If you're mm-hmm. new to cooking, because it's a bit more on the sciencey side, you know, you follow the the steps and then you put it in and they set the timer. Yeah, <laughs> you know, as long as you don't it's do like too something too every, complicated. Everybody in the pool, mix it together, pour it into something, like right, super and, then easy. Bake, and then right? bake, right? Yeah. Whereas, you know, when you do something in the pan, it's like, oh, we'll cook it for about this many minutes to this many minutes, and <laughs> flip sides, and you, especially when you're making meat, it yeah, really co- depends. Cooking what, protein is 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 challenging and scary. Yeah. It's challenging. It, you know, all p- pieces of meat are different as far as sizing and thickness and how cold they were when they were in the pan and just how hot your pan was. There's just all kinds of variables. Sometimes it's kind of nice to start with some baking. And that's where we started with our daughters because it's a lot more prescriptive of exactly how much, not that there's not variation, especially variation in ovens and things, but Mm -hmm. it's a bit, it's a a bit easier than going to a pan. So if you don't feel comfortable cooking, take heart. You've got this. We've got a great cookbook that we'll recommend further down uh, for kids that it would be fabulous for adults too, that don't, you know, feel very comfortable cooking Absolutely. to get so, started. So they, they're a little uncomfortable, but they're going to take a baby steps. Next thing is how to have a positive experience. How can they ensure that, you know, they don't burn the house down? The first time? <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously safety is a big safety part, first. but um, as far as cooking with your kids, it, it can go pear shaped. I'm not going to lie. And so these are our tips to, you know, make it a really great experience for you and for them. Bulletproof guaranteed. No tears. Uh, <laughs> that might be a warranty I can't live up to. No, I, I think that, you know. That warranty is good for about five minutes. <laughs> you should be able to have a really positive experience. Yeah. First off, choose recipes that align with your or your child's skill level and their age. Don't try to do something crazy with your kids that's totally out of bounds. You know, with my. Homemade churros. Mm, yeah, you know, I, I make homemade churros, and but that involves frying and making pate choux, and, and my kids are too young. Um, so <laughs> instead, you know, I, we do things with our kids like uh, you made pretzels with them the other day, did, yes. and they helped mix the pretzels, then they helped roll the pretzels and shape them, then you did all the boiling and stuff, and you felt comfortable with that. Yeah. Like, don't take on something either you feel uncomfortable with or you feel is above your kid's level. Um, or doesn't align with their interests. Mm-hmm. You know, for for example, sometimes we're doing our around the world study and a recipe comes up and we look at each other and we're like, no one in this house is going to like that. No. You know, that's the pureed eggplant. No one's going to like that. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I'll, I'll go and I'll find a different recipe that is representative of that culture of something that I know is going to be more amenable. As much as I want my kids to try new foods, I also don't want to slave over the stove with them for everyone in the family to hate it. So... <laughs> You know, there's a balance, but, you know, choose recipes carefully, I think is a, a really um, important one and that, that align well with what you think your kids are capable of doing. Um, Cause you know, if you've got a recipe that has 20 steps and your kids can only help out with two of them, yeah, it's not worth that's it. probably not worth it. Um, whereas it would be better to just, you know, choose a recipe that your kids can help out with more of. Um, the next thing is a lot of preparation. So the first thing you want to prepare for is the time. So don't rush it. You don't want to be in a hurry. You don't want yeah. to you know, have to be doing a lot of things. This really isn't quickly. like a timing no. a meal situation. It usually takes me twice as long to cook <laughs> with the kids as it would if I was doing it on my own. So just you know, make sure that you have ample time to complete it. Um, and as far as timing goes, there's, there's some cook prep steps that I would mm-hmm. like to encourage. <laughs> um, and kids can help with this, but... Print out the recipe if you can, or open the book someplace so it can stay open. Now, I do a lot of recipes off my phone, and do you know how many times the screen turns off right when I just have my head in my hands and chicken or something, and I can't get the screen to turn back on? If you can possibly actually physically print a recipe, it is better. Or, you know, have a I have a book stand, and I can prop my book open there where yeah, but, everyone can see it. But Facebook, I mean, the, the Apple has solved this. You just... Sweetie, touch the phone and put put it in front of mommy's face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's there's so many times, especially if I'm doing a recipe that's from Pinterest, and sometimes yeah. it won't even save, and I have to go back into it. You know, just 
if you're working with small kids and you don't have time to mess with any of that, try to print out the recipe. Um, clear your working surface fully before you start. Yeah, don't don't work on an area that's cluttered. Y- yeah. yeah, don't try to like clean as you you know clean up things as you go. Like clear the countertops, make plenty of space, empty the sink and potentially the dishwasher before you start. It is so much easier cooking with kids when you can just take something and put it right into the dishwasher or right into the sink. Yeah. Um, because otherwise then the, the countertops get crowded and that's one of the areas where things that could be dangerous happen. Yeah, like There's pulling things of- down. You want, you want like if you do a dish or you're doing like a bowl or you're cutting stuff up, you want to be, have a place to put that where it's safe. Right, exactly. So definitely, you know, clear your work surface fully, empty your sink, Get your dishwasher empty if you think you need to, depending on how many dishes you're going to make. And what about ingredients? Get out all your ingredients. Yes. Pre-measure those ingredients for your preschoolers. Just trust me on this one. It's so hard for me. The n- number of times I've tried to make something. Mm-hmm. When our older daughter was younger and I started cooking with her, I made this mistake a lot that I would try to measure with her there. And she required so much of my attention that I would mismeasure. Yep. <laughs> so if you have really little ones you're cooking with, try to pre-measure your ingredients. Oh, and, and along with that is there's there's always always the equity challenge especially when you got multiple kids you know you do want to make sure that you know each kid gets to do one of the things you know like they will tell me it's like oh i want to do that no i wanted to put the oil in so it's like sometimes i am half measuring things so they can put one person can put oil in then the next person can put oil in i find that you know depending on how young they are it's easier to have everything just set out ready in little mise en place type bowls (laughs) you are making more dishes but it's just easier. And but then, because you cleaned the sink and you got the dishwasher cleared, yeah, you're ready. To you're go. kind of ready for it. So the other thing is get out all your, your cooking supplies before you start. This is, you know, your larger bowls, your cutting boards, you know, um, for, you know, whatever you've got for, if you, if you've got something like, uh, like it's going to be or really, like yeah. really messy, get bigger bowls <laughs> than you need. Like if you need a medium bowl, get an extra large bowl because, you know, they're going to be very messy when they're mixing and you don't want to splatter everywhere. So, you know, get out things that are a little big, um, you know, try to take out as much of your cooking supplies as possible and have them ready. Because the times when, like today, for example, as you're talking yep. about our toddler got to the whisk and started whisking flour all over the place, um, I was had my back turned because I was getting a cooking sheet out. Yep. And it's that so was fast. my mistake. It's so fast. It was so fast. Um, you know, I was using my KitchenAid and I got the bowl out. And at one point my toddler went towards the KitchenAid as I was, you know, carrying it across the room and trying to <laughs> scoop it out. And I had to go and, you know, get her really quick. So just know that, you know, these are, these are my best, these are the best laid plans. And even I don't always do these. And when I don't, I regret it <laughs> like tonight. Yep. So definitely get all your stuff out. Ensure your kids can reach all the areas that they need to access. So if you need a footstool for them or they have some of these really great helpers, towers, depending on, um, you know, how, how old your kids are, mm-hmm. but make sure that they can reach. There's times we've started, got halfway into cooking and realized that my daughter could not reach. And then we had to stop, wash our hands, go find a stool. Mm-hmm. So make sure that they can reach, um, dress your child in a- appropriately pull their hair back, you know, you might want to put them in an old shirt or an apron <laughs> or something, depending on what you're doing. Yeah, we got some cooking aprons that are the grandmas have and the great grandmas have have made for them. Yeah, yeah, and it's really helpful. Sometimes we just put our toddler in a smock because it really <laughs> is the best way to go. So make sure that they're ready for it. Um, really important to show your kids how to properly wash their hands. Yeah, and it's a good time for that. Yeah, inspect them. So my kids are great at going to wash their hands and coming back with soap all over their little (laughs) hands. So not only teaching them like to use soap and all of that, but that they also need to rinse them off and then how to inspect and make sure that there's no soap. You know, sometimes we're right in the middle of something and I need to send them to wash their hands without me. Uh, And so it's really good You know, work with that with your kids so they know how to do that. I mean, I think in the age of COVID, all of our kids know how to wash their hands, but you know, if you're, if your kids aren't comfortable with it, make sure that there's like, before we start cooking, for example, we always put a step stool in the bathroom by the sink mm-hmm. so that when I tell them to go wash their hands later, it's already there for them. They don't have to like take their dirty hands to go get the step stool, <laughs> <laughs> then wash the hands. Spread that E. coli everywhere. Right. <laughs> so 
And then the last thing is about distractions. So silence your yeah. cell phone, turn off the TV. I love music when I'm cooking. When I'm cooking with my youngest daughter, my toddler, I don't have any music on because no. I just don't want to be distracted because that's when accidents can happen in the yeah, kitchen. Especially, especially when you're on the stove, like especially if you're trying to push the edge a little bit when you got something cooking at the stove, it's a little bit of a concern. You know, you get distracted. You yeah, don't want that you to got happen. mixers out. You're cutting stuff. I mean, there's there's so many opportunities. I really find that our cooking classroom. Uh, experiences go best when I give my kids my complete focus. And that's why all this prep is so important. I don't have to, I don't have to look at the yeah. recipe for ingredients stuff. I maybe have to check for steps, but I don't have to pre-measure. I mean, yeah. a lot of these things. Now, if you have older kids and this isn't as much of a concern, exactly. you know, yeah. your mileage may vary on some of this <laughs> stuff. If you're cooking with your 10 year old, you know, maybe you don't need to do all these steps, but I, I wanted to cover all of them in case you are cooking with littles and you can take out whichever of these things you don't feel are necessary anymore for your family. Absolutely. So that's all the preparation. Next thing is a little bit of safety, you know, knives, heat, you know, there's a lot of option, you know, getting the, uh, the vinegar and taking a swig, you know, those are things we don't want to happen, <laughs> right? Especially with cleaning materials, too. I mean, they all kind of go together. Being safe is a is a big thing you want to really push. Yeah. So for me, I think the best thing to do is to talk, to teach safety about an item before you use it. So rather than trying to do it while you've got the, you know, the knife out, you know, so you, you want to just, you want to be sure that you've given that safety. Prevent. Okay, we're going to be using the oven. So the oven's going to be hot in a few minutes. We're going to be using a knife and I'm going to place it over here and we're not going to touch it when I pull it out, except when I tell you or, you know, whatever, like yeah. give them the right act. Prevention, right? <laughs> Prevention for like a lot of times when I'm using the knives, I'm like, when I'm done with it, I set it away. So I know it's not close. Right. It's not even close for her to grab. I like to give a pre-safety briefing. And then if you have a really young child, you have to give that give it a little bit again as you pull out the yeah. item. The six, so. the six year old is pretty good. Like we, I don't have to worry too much about it. Yeah. Her. But with the toddler, we, yeah. you, before I even turn the oven on, I say the oven's going to be on, honey, it's going to be hot. So no, you know, don't go near the oven. And then as the oven gets up to temperature, I remind her again, the oven is hot, you know? So just be aware of your kids, depending on age. I, I just find it's good sometimes to, to think about the safety aspects before you get started of what you're going to use during your recipe. And it's helpful because you've already got your, your cooking supplies. You kind of know where the danger points are and you can explain that to your kids. Cause sometimes right, right when you get in the middle of cooking and you have to do something quickly, it's not the best time to have to explain. Well, and especially um, safety around utensils and things that are in the kitchen, but also there are sensitive food products like meats, Absolutely. peppers, you know, other type of products that could cause harm or be unsanitary. Those are other things you got to be concerned about. That's right. So if, if something's going to require hand washing after use or segregation, or please don't touch your eyes <laughs> after using that, <laughs> um, make sure that you, you know, you give that briefing before that starts. And, and remember that, you know, you're really young learners. You're going to have to very carefully supervise or maybe choose a recipe that doesn't have something like yeah. if, if I cook a recipe with chicken, I usually deal with the chicken part of it and have my girls make the marinade or yeah. you know the, the coating or whatever we're doing um but i would actually handle that just because i it's too difficult for me to try to make sure that we don't have a salmonella risk with the young kids yeah absolutely so what are some of the items that we we like the most like there's we have a lot of things in our kitchen mm -hmm. you know where should people start like what, what would our be our recommendations so the most handy things for me uh we have a kids nylon knife and cutting board set yeah. it's really great these little nylon knives are um they're serrated they work pretty well on a lot of things and they're, the cutting they're pretty, board they're still pretty sharp I mean, yeah, they're sharp enough but they're kid sized you know they're they're plastic so um they they are much more appropriate than an adult knife they're well sized for their hands the cutting board is actually one that that folds so you can pour it into a bowl right so that you can kind of you know things don't go all over the place it's easier for their for their size i really think that that set wasn't very expensive we'll put a link in the show notes i think yeah. it's a real must for anyone who's going to cook regularly with their young kids because it's all appropriately sized i can teach my six-year-old how to be safe with an adult knife but it's still really too big for her <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and 
it being too big leads to safety issues. So I really like these kids nylon knife sets. Well, it's great for like vegetable prep and 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 fruit cut fruit cutting. You can go out anywhere from an apple all the way to something delicate if you want to like have grapes. You know, they can do that as well. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that they can do with those knives. I think they're really great. And we the set we have has three different sizes, so yeah. they're really great. So let's talk a little bit about America's Test Kitchen. This is a great PBS show um fantastic what was the guy's name who, who ran the thing oh i don't remember what his he name he had was. glasses kind of i know i know hair, we, we watched it guy. so we watched it so many years um yeah america's test kitchen is terrific yeah. right they've tried all these different uh, recipes if you're not familiar with them they they will say like uh we're gonna make a chocolate chip cookie we're gonna make 50 chocolate chip cookies yeah. and we're gonna give you the best recipe and here's why um so all the recipes are really tried and true they make two excellent kids cookbooks they make a, a america's test kitchen kids cookbook and one that's a baking book um they are awesome they're perfect for kitchen classroom um and and if you are one of those folks who doesn't feel comfortable cooking as an adult yourself these are great books to do with your kids they they go through all the basics um i think they're probably appropriate for maybe eight seven eight up you know, I, I don't think that, you know, we have one of them, but we are waiting. We're not, we haven't given it to our six-year-old yet because she's just not quite old enough, but we do have it and it's, it's going to be perfect when she gets a little bit older. And also the recipes are a little bit simpler. They're not as complex, especially yeah, for the totally kids. Yeah, they're totally appropriate. I mean, it's a little different than say the adult America's Test Kitchen cookbook that we have as well, that we also recommend wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. Um, that that is a little bit more complex recipes. It These is. are a little bit simpler, a little bit easier to do. They're perfect for kids and, and, and great for a beginner cooker, anyways. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and they're going to be good recipes. It's it's great place to get to get to if your kids love to cook. So now they've got a cookbook. They picked up a couple of them. They said, "Okay, we're going to do this." What about a cooking stand, cookbook stand? I think a cookbook stand. Yeah, I, I agree. Invaluable. We have a nice heavy metal cookbook stand. Yeah. It's great because you know if you open the cookbook pages, it's mm -hmm. difficult that they you know they end up getting. Um, they end up getting dirty for can't one. Can't see it because it's on the other side of the you counter. You can't see it, or the pages flip. I mean, it's just I like the cookbook stand because we can put it up and kind of put it out of the way. It's it's much safer, and I think a good cookbook stand is really important. It's not going to stop you getting stuff on your cookbook, but I, I think that's a good sign of a used cookbook is that the cookbook <laughs> is completely. You know, the pages <laughs> are a little right. warped. That's There's right. a little bit of balsamic vinaigrette in the, in the top <laughs> yeah. corner. You know, it's not going to keep it clean, but it's going to keep it out of the way. Yeah. Especially if you have just like a shallow um, cooking counter that you're using, you want to put it up against the wall. You don't want it to take up so much space. Yeah, I like just keeping it out of the way. It keeps it. It keeps the book safe. It keeps it, You know, keeps us uh, with greater working space in our small kitchen. Works out great. How about um. You know, utensils, right? We, we have big people utensils for big people hands, but we're cooking with little people. Yeah. You know, I know Babish likes to talk about his mini whisk. We have a mini whisk have and a mini it whisk is life well. changing. It is. Um, yeah. I think <laughs> you want to get some small stirring spoons, a mini whisk, some small tongs, a small spatula. Mm -hmm. These are not expensive items. Yep. You know, we'll put some links in the show notes to some ones we like, but they're, they're not expensive and they really will help your kiddo. Uh, to be able to have more control when they're when they're cooking, you're going to have less accidents and spills mm -hmm. and things if they have just a few basic utensils that are appropriately sized. Exactly, and you can give them tasks that are appropriately sized as well. That's right. Absolutely. So, what about a potato smasher? Who potato love? master. Who doesn't love a potato masher? If you don't have one, it's like the. I mean, you can do lots of more than just potatoes with it, but our kids absolutely love it. It's like their favorite tool to use. So <laughs> if you don't have one, get a potato masher. <laughs> They're so great. Easy. They're I just, I know that seems silly, but it's one of our kids' like favorite tools in the kitchen. And it makes easy mashed potatoes. It's it does. Because every, mashed potatoes are not supposed to be pureed. You know, dehydrated mashed potatoes reconstituted. <laughs> They're supposed to be a little lumpy, and that's what that gives you. That's right, because you get gives you good lumpy, lumpy potatoes. How about a salad spinner? Yeah, a salad spinner is one of those things. I think that. <laughs> yeah, we got one for our wedding, and we've had it for love all it. these years, twelve I years, I guess. Um, yeah, they're great. You know, the thing that I like about ours it has a removable bowl in it that's yeah. a, a strainer. It, it, it guarantees that your salad is. It's dry. Sometimes when you wash your salad and you like kind of shake it out, yeah. throw it in the in the in the bowl, it's still wet. And then you have to put your dressing on it, and all your dressing just oops. Oh, it's goops terrible. To the bottom. It's awful. The salad spinner is. It's one of those great. And tools. we're not salad snobs. And our kids love to use the salad spinner. Yes, they love to do it, which is why we listed it here. <laughs> How about an offset spatula? 
Yeah. So whenever you're looking at doing any kind of icing, I mean, yes, you can use a butter knife. I've done it for years. Get, get, get yourself an offset spatula. It is the way to go. They're super cheap. Um, Describe an offset spatula. It's, it's, um, if you, if you think about what a, like a butter knife would be, except it, it goes down and then has a flat piece so you can hold your hand. Hook in it. Yeah. You can hold your hand, um, above parallel to the surface you're going to work on yep. and it, it's actually down and it's perfectly flat. So if you want like ice a cake yep. or, um, you know, you want to, um, spread the top of your mashed potatoes perfectly An offset spatula is just like, <laughs> it's a really great thing. Well, it goes back to the art and the presentation. And that's the preparation, right. That's right. right. You want to do things appropriately. It's one of those tools. If you don't have one, you just really need one. And I didn't realize this until your mother gave me one of the extra ones she had earlier this year. And then I went, oh my gosh, where have I lived all my life without an offset spatula? <laughs> How about a no slip bowls? I mean, you're, 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 you're mixing things. Kids are around. Yeah. The last thing you want to do is things sliding around. You need to get some of those OXO good grips bowls yeah. with the nice rubber bottoms on them. Yeah. We, every time we pull out one of our metal bowls, we are always sorry <laughs> because the good grips bowls are so much easier for the kids. They just, they don't slide around on the countertop. Um, and they have these really nice, um, big handles for them to hold on to, especially with little hands. It makes things a lot easier. So we really recommend that you get some non-slip bowls. Well, and, the, and you know, one of the important things is, you know, when you're cooking and you're going full, you know, Gordon Ramsay, having a good rolling pin for discipline <laughs> it's really important. Yeah. Get a good rolling pin. But we're not talking about like one of those like cheapy spinning ones. I'm talking about a good pastry rolling pin. <laughs> it's firm. It does I job. like a French rolling pin because do it too. doesn't have any. We had a regular one, you know, with the two handles. It kind of looks like corn on the cob, right? With the two handles and it rolls <laughs> in the center. And it actually had these like metal. Um, Ball bearings or something? Yeah, yeah. bearings inside and they it. Were they were oiled. And yeah, and, they, and it had to be oiled and they started to break and out, there yeah. was problems with it. I prefer a nice, big, just solid wood French rolling pin myself. Yeah, so it's a, it's a tapered rolling pin, one solid piece of wood. I mean, probably composite in some respects, but. You can get a nice one. They're pretty heavy. It requires you to roll roll it through your hands in order to roll things. It's out. also perfect. It's a, you have to like you it's know. A, it's a little smash butter. And... Yeah, it's a little different than like a normal rolling pin. But once you get into it, once you you figure out, it's so versatile. Like what you said, like you can smash, you can tenderize things with it. You can mm -hmm. do a lot of things. It really is nice, and I think you want to have a nice a nice rolling pin for well, all your work. And, and and children will fear the French rolling pin, <laughs> not more than the other one. <laughs> So those are our favorite items for, for the kitchen, some kid items and some things that we think you should have in your kitchen, you know, besides the basics, obviously you've got to have, you know, your basic, you know, utensils and knives and cookware and things like that. Um, I would also say, be really careful about your baking sheets and mm -hmm. make sure that you, you know, don't, you know, you're not going to want to use your, your giant baking sheets with your kids. You're going to want to use smaller ones. Um, you also might want to use metal pans as opposed to ceramic or glass because they're just a lot lighter for kids to deal with um, and a lot less chance of breakage. So just be thoughtful about the tools that you use. And if you see your kids struggling with something, think about whether there might be a better product that you could, you know, yeah. you could use for them. So, so when people are starting off cooking, the, the more important thing is to get the skill. Once they mm -hmm. have skills and they start to enjoy cooking and you're enjoying the whole cooking process and food becomes this thing, talk a little bit about the quality of the products. Like I th that's a big thing for us. Yeah. I, I, we're starting to buy quality products now. Yeah. We started out our lives buying things that were really cheap when we first got out of college and just didn't really realize. And, um, as we've gone on, we've realized, you know, the value of buying quality. I think a lot of people do, so, yeah. but especially in the kitchen, you know, if you're going on Amazon and things, it's really easy to buy a really cheap thing. Mm -hmm. um, be a little bit cautious. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're cautious in all parts of your life. Absolutely. Everybody is going on Amazon, but especially with cooking stuff, because it can be a safety issue. Uh, if it breaks, it could, it could injure somebody. And what we've found with like, with the items we've mentioned, if you yeah. buy a quality one, you'll have it forever. Um, yeah. and like a good, a good knife, some good pots and pans. Yeah. Good, good, uh, good baking sheets. Yeah. Good, you know, equipment in the kitchen. I think it lasts longer. Um, especially like, you know, we, we, our kitchen aid is starting to go. And we need to get a new one. You know, we wouldn't get like a cheapy one. I would really encourage you to get a good one. We right. had a Bosch yeah. mixer for a long time. Yeah, so you know, we, we like these having 
good products in our house. You know, I think the big thing that right. we're starting to move up to is good knives. I, yeah, you know, having good knives. And make sure that your knives are appropriately sharp. Yes. There's there's almost nothing more dangerous than a dull knife. So yeah. be really cautious of that. You know, that that's the, the biggest accidents that could happen in the yeah. kitchen. Just, you know, observe the normal safety rules. So, but sl- slowly over time, fill in your, your quality of your products. Yeah, we encourage get quality. And you can often find a lot of things at Thrift, too, that people, you know, people think they're going to, bake or whatever and they end up donating stuff so you yeah. can also find some really good products there and you know get yourself a like a quality cast iron pan and yeah, you yeah. know a few things like that, that you can really um these these cookbooks that we've talked about have some basic supplies in the beginning of them mm-hmm. really take a look at those and think about buying quality of those kind of basics if you know you're not used to cooking you don't have very much cooking supplies but we hope that this was helpful and that you feel empowered to get in the kitchen with your kids and learn and make it a really great positive experience send us pictures of the stuff you make i mean yeah. we're all about food well, here I mean, we, so. we post we post things on our instagram as well so follow along there yeah yeah, yeah. ariel everybody can cook <laughs> Everyone can do it. Anyway, so let's end this the same way we always do and what we're into. Ariel, Harry Potter mystery app. Go. Yes. Yes. Um, We are into Hogwarts mystery. This is a free app for uh, iOS and Android. Um, This is one of those. We have it on the iPad. Yeah, we have it on our iPad. This is one of those things that um, it's got lots of like in-app purchase opportunities for you to spend lots of money so make sure before you get this that you go in and you turn off the ability for your device to do in-app purchases because that's what i did just to protect yourself um this is a kind of a it's a harry potter it's a game that takes place before harry potter like while he's growing up at the dursleys before he goes to hogwarts but after he defeated the dark lord kind of between there um and it's your (gasps) spoilers ariel well, I mean, you see that in the trailer. There are moms, uh, maybe there are moms who are reading right along. <laughs> Ignore this. R- rewind. <laughs> <laughs> so so it takes place in that time period. And, uh, you know, it's a story of a girl and yeah. she goes yeah. through the castle. And, you know, it's one of those you're leveling up your experience and you're learning potions. And there's not a lot of action here. It is all reading and that's why we have it on our daughter's ipad so well she's well just beyond that though you're on the third book with her right now right we just started the third book we have been incorporating you have been rereading the first two and now you're on to the third one we have reread the first two i think two or three times now we have also incorporated the audiobooks as well. She gets yeah, free run she's of a the big audio. She's a big Harry Potter fan. Yeah, and so she is a very big Harry Potter fan and we are trying to leverage that intense interest into helping, you know, bring her up even further in her reading abilities. Right. And so that is why we've done this. Right. right. Every so every screen in this it's like um, your character talks to somebody else and there's no actual, you know, spoken words. It's all just dialogue on the screen and it stays there until you tap the screen. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how long it takes us to read the lines. It stays put and then you tap and it goes to the next character. So we don't let our daughter, our daughter's only six. So she doesn't play this by herself. She and I sit there together and I use my finger, go over the words and any words that I think she should be able to sound out we stop at and she does and she has been doing so much reading and she loves playing this app i swear we only get through we don't even get through a whole like chapter which isn't very long like if i were playing it i would have probably hit a i think there's like a time limit on it where you can only go so far and then it will make you like wait three or four hours before you can play again or you have to pay we've never hit that time limit because we (laughs) we are going so slowly because we have to read all of it she's getting so much amazing reading practice out of this now apps like this can be addictive and things so i mean use it carefully with us we're doing it we're sitting down directly you're with doing her it together. It's a, it's a almost mentor like thing where it's almost like you're reading a book, right? We're absolutely doing it together. So I guess this, what we're into, I mean, this is what we're into, but also to say, if your child has an intense interest in something and you're having a struggling reader, maybe see if there's some sort of a game or something that you can find that, you know, I, I didn't expect to find so much amazing reading practice in, a an app that's trying to get you to buy stuff. And uh, I really did. So, so uh, you're, you're using them instead of them using you. I am. Way to I turn am. the tables there, Ariel. Well, I'm not going to pay four ninety nine to bring a cat to Hogwarts when I can do it in chapter four. No. <laughs> and you know, there's aren't, there aren't like too many hit ups for money. There are a few, but uh, 
but yeah, I, I think as long as you're careful about it, I, I know a mom friend who says she's addicted to this game and she's been playing it for like years and she <laughs> will play it for like an hour a day. She loves it. So I, you know, it, like all things, it could be addictive. Um, yeah. but I'm sitting there with my daughter and it's helping her to get some really great reading practice. So for that, I like it. Do they take dog money in the game? <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!